Good afternoon. Welcome to the EFG webinar, GeoFood Connection Between Geology and Food. My name is Monica Souza, and I am the coordinator of the European Federation of Geology's panel of experts on geological heritage. I will be the host of the webinar for today. The European Federation of Geologists is peri peri periodically organizing webinars to foster the professional development of fellow geologists and also to increase public awareness of the importance of geoscience. I am delighted to present the presenters of today's webinar, Sara Gentilini. Sara is an archaeologist, historian and project manager of the Magma UNESCO Geopark in Norway. She is responsible for the international networking activities and EU Nordic funded projects. She is the inventor of the GeoFood brand for food enterprises within UNESCO Global Geoparks local communities. Sara is a Marie Curie PhD candidate at the Earth Department of Turin University with the new international program Tech for Culture. She is studying geodiversity and abiotic ecosystem services in the framework of UNESCO Global Geoparks. Sara is a member of the UNESCO Evaluation Team for UNESCO Global Geopark Territories. She has several, several years of experience as a project manager for international projects related to geological interpretation, education, culture, geotourism and cooperation with local stakeholders, universities, communities and aspiring geopark territories. She is passionate about cultural diversity and creative processes and loves to learn and explore. Sara, please you can start the presentation. GeoFood, connection between geology and food when you are ready. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monica, for your kind introduction. And thank you so much in behalf of Magma UNESCO Global Geopark in Norway to the European Federation of Geologists for this kind invitation. We are delighted to be here and have the possibility to speak about GeoFood. So as I said, we are delighted to be invited uh, to uh, have a voice uh, in this uh, very interesting seminar organized by the European uh, Federation of Geologists. And uh, here I am, I am, I am Sara Gentilini, I'm working in Magma UNESCO Global Geopark in Norway since 2010. Magma Geopark is located in southwest of Norway, is including five municipalities, Egerzud, Lund, Flekifjord, Sokendal and Bjerkem. It is also included two regions which is Rogaland and Agder. It's about 2,329 kilometers square, and uh, we've been running the Geopark since 2008. It's a private public uh, uh, company, share company, actually. We've been uh, running more than 20 international projects and developing sustainable tourism, culture, food, and research. Uh, what I'm going to start the presentation with is not uh, specifically Geofood, but it's a book that I've been reading this summer a book about uh, life on our planet by Sir David Attenborough. And actually this book is speaking about uh, when we remember about environmental disasters, uh, when, what and wh why we remember about that and what we actually learn from them. Actually uh, has been scientifically proved that what we pay attention to the environment is when it is uh, related to us, when an event, it affects us. So, Starting from his book, he's analyzing the population and carbon uh, in the atmosphere and wilderness, starting from its year of birth in 1937. In 1937, the world population was 2.3 million billion of people. The carbon in the atmosphere was 280 parts per million, and the remaining wildness on Earth was 66%. Going, uh, uh, getting from 20, 2020, when uh, David Attenborough was 87 years old, the world population was about 7.8 billion people. The carbon in the atmosphere is, was, at least in 2020, 4,015 parts per million, and the remaining wildness is only 35%. What has happening in between, apart the David Attenborough getting old? It happened us. Actually, humankind is the main uh, reason for this decline. Uh, as you may know, since you are probably much more expert than me, since I suppose that the audience is uh, composed by geologists and scientists, uh, actually, during the Holocene, 
the temperature uh, changed uh, a lot. And uh, someone say that was the, probably the beginning of the agriculture. Some other scientists say that uh, it's related with the different kind of development, but all the sciences agree that the main reason for this uh, change in average of temperature uh, to the, a very huge increase of temperature all around the globe is due to human activities. So basically it's the, what the, uh, human, what the science uh, community uh, is calling this period Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is the period of the man. And of course, I'm very aware that hasn't been recognized by geologists as a geological uh, period and a geological layer, uh, but the Anthropocene is here and the Anthropocene is something that we have to cope with and we have to find solution for. So I please ask to share the, a brief introduction video that explain what Anthropocene is. So, okay, I think I catch your attention with this short video and that was about Anthropocene. And yes, uh, I like to go through very quickly to the picture that are the same picture that you saw in the videos. This is a Carrara, is actually a UNESCO Global Geopark in Tuscany and this marble has been extracted like that for centuries. Uh, these are other landscape around the world. And uh, as we know, half of the fertile land on earth is, cool, is currently fair, farmed and uh, it's often uh, uh, spray with pesticide and uh, the, the topsoil has been uh, destroyed all around and we have to say that we eat 50 billion chicken a year and feed them with soy planted on the forested land. Uh, plus there are some uh, problem, we have big huge problem with the, with the garbage and the trash. Here is the Dandora Nairobi biggest dump site and is one of the lar largest unregulated landfills which is uh, creating serious health issue to the population. And it is uh, in the list of the international agency for one of the most polluted area in the world. And here is the ivory barn outside Nairobi in 1991. And uh, as we all know, the polar bear <laughs> need ice as uh, the, uh, the ice is melting very fast. And the result is that the, the female polar bears are giving birth to smaller cubes. These smaller cubes are not really resistant to the climate and it's getting uh, very, very difficult for them to survive. Uh, these pictures, they, they could seem rather far away from the thematic that the, the seminar was all about, but actually there is, there is a huge connections because uh, what I'm going to speak about, uh, it's about UNESCO Global Geopark program and it's about geofood that has its root inside UNESCO Global Geopark. A UNESCO Global Geopark is also uh, about sustainable use of uh, geological resources and sustainable development. So these pictures we, and the videos uh, are made for me to catch the attention on the uh, global problem on the climate change, because we very often, we scientists meet each other and discuss about these issues, but I don't think that we reflect enough uh, what each of us could do or what each of us of our network could do to create solutions for this uh, huge problem. But most of all, what each of us as individual could do to make the difference, because each of us as individual, as a scientist, can make a big difference. So I, I don't need to mention the fact that uh, the corals become white. And during the, the shooting of the movie of uh, David uh, Attenborg, uh, the, the crew for the first time noticed this phenomena outside the, uh, Australia. And uh, of course, this happened when the, the sea getting too warm and uh, the, um, the animal which live in the coral, they just disappear and they don't manage to make color anymore. And the coral is basically that uh, there are actually um, also enormously amount of uh, garbage as called as Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which are actually at the moment two or three in the Pacific and running around. And what we could see is the surface of it. They are, it's basically a big net of microplastic that are running around the sea. Uh, we all know what the plastic are doing to the animal and to the habitat. And uh, we are all very, uh, we're starting to be very aware about the damage of the plastic. Um, I'm not sure that all of us is very aware of uh, the damage of microplastic and also on the other pollutant. Anyway, I found it extremely interesting and i like to share with you uh, the so-called planetary boundaries. The planetary boundaries is the theory that has been developed recently uh, in Sweden 
And these planetary boundaries are actually showing uh, the level of boundaries and where are we are now and which kind of boundaries we are ultrapassing and which kind of boundaries we are uh, still into the limit before Earth become totally uh, not possible to live in. Uh, what it, it made me uh, very much reflecting is that uh, on this in the, the upper column it's the increasing risk and uh, there are some of these um, detective, detected uh, indicators which are not uh, yet quantified. That means that we don't know the effect of that uh, pollutant in the atmosphere if it goes outside the limit. The effect are not really yet quantified and are not really yet studied. So we are in a field that not many scientists know what is going to happen. Uh, the, as I said, the, the planetary boundaries is being revised in 2015. They include the climate change, novel entities, stratospheric ozone deflection, atmospheric aerosol loading, ocean acidification, biogeochemical flows, freshwater use, plant system change, biosphere integrity. And as you can see, at least three of those are in red. So they are be beyond the zone of uncertainty. So it's a high risk. Uncertainty means that we don't know what is happening if we are going on like that. And this is about biosphere integrity, fresh um, bio geochemical flows, but also the others are uh, really close by to be uh, behind the zone of uncertainty. So the situation is not really so, uh, say, uh, happy around us. But we are in, in, the, in the phase of the so-called great decline. And uh, as we know, uh, the wealthiest uh, 60 percent in the world are the responsible for almost 50 percent of the environmental impact and uh, we are all speaking here and most of us is probably part of that 16 percent uh, the thing is that there it cannot exist uh, some kind of climate justice if we don't work on the social justice as well this is the main problem climate justice without social justice is just a uh, very nice talk but it don't have any effect, real effect on the development what will the next 100 years look like if we don't change? Actually, the prediction for 2030 is that, uh, if at, that at this kind of uh, uh, speed, the Amazon rainforest could suffer from forest dieback. So actually, we are destroying its biodiversity and the, and the rainforest is getting um, less and less with a big, big loss of biodiversity. That, Basically, what we maybe never think about is the displacement of about 30 million people just in 2030, because the, the migration due to climate change is also one of the biggest issues that we are facing. So fewer trees and more carbon will they escalate global warming significantly. And uh, these uh, very ice-free summers will also start in the Arctic. And the day, like today, that in Italy, in, at the end of October, in north of Italy, you have about 27 degrees. Is it just the starting? So less ice in the Arctic will be also, the Arctic will also be unable to cool the planet down. Uh, the prediction for 2050 are also, uh, uh, of course, if we go business as usual, they are also not very comforting. Uh, the coral reef don't like acid, of course, and 90% of our coral reef would die. And the, the plankton affecting the, will also disappear, affecting the entire food chain. Because we have to remember that everything in the, in the nature is very connected. The abiotic system are the base for the biotic system, but everything is very much interconnected. The 22nd century uh, could be a massive and forced human migration. And this could be, I'm not going into the detail because as I said, uh, there are catastrophic uh, vision about it. But the, the thing is that it's not too late. So David Atterberg in his book, he gave hope. And that's what, when, at, at this moment, I start this presentation with hope. So it's not really too late. The other problem that we embrace the attitude that it's too late, too little too late. So then at the same time, we do not act too fast. That is also why I started my presentation with the catastrophe uh, uh, scenario, if we are going on as business as usual, because we have this fatalistic attitude that we have a lot of time in front. Actually, we don't have a lot of time in front, but doesn't mean that it's too late. It means that we need to act now. So 
the thing is that there are good examples and best practices around the globe that make us thinking that when humankind want to solve an issue, even this, the climate change is the biggest uh, issue and the biggest uh, challenge that the humankind has never faced. Humankind can find solutions together. So uh, here I take you some example, for instance, from uh, uh, Morocco. Morocco has the, the biggest solar panel field and uh, there are about more than a million Moroccans that get electricity from this field. At the same time, there are a fantastic example. I'm mean, taking the example from David Attenborough, the Revillagigedo Re Archipelago National Park in uh, uh, Mexico, which has been established in 1990 and now the biodiversity increased more than 400 percent and of course there are examples in Costa Rica the Costa Rica government has made an, am an amazing strategy they they offer a farmers grant to replant indigenous trees and most of all one of the one of the measures is also that when tourists are visiting Costa Rica they pay a tourist fee the, and the tourist fee it goes for uh, nature and biodiversity uh, one of the of the I think best practice in this field is also, of course, the International Geoscience and Geopar program that has been established in 2015. As you know, is one of the uh, is it's the most um, modern program developed by UNESCO. So it's not as well, as well known as the World Heritage List program. We born in 2015, and we merged together the International Geoscience program and UNESCO Global Geopar Network. UNESCO Global Geoparks uh, uh, are single unified geographical area where the site and landscape have international geological significance, of course, and are managed with a holistic concept of protection, education. Basically, they are lab laboratories for sustainable development. At the moment, there are many more than 164. There are about 177. The, the thing is that uh, I couldn't make... Uh, uh, hundreds of examples from UNESCO Global Geopark uh, and sustainable practice because they are, we are really developing amazing projects in education, in uh, uh, protection of geological heritage, protection of biodiversity. So uh, I consider the um, UNESCO Global Geopark as one of the uh, best practices that give us hope for the future. Uh, I want to say that about 3% uh, uh, of the surface of Europe is actually covered by UNESCO Global Geopark. And I like to stress the fact that UNESCO Global Geopark are not uh, imposing any protection status, but they are working with local communities to find together a way to uh, develop in a sustainable way. What is sustainable development? Sustainable development, uh, it's, it's basically a definition. So the overall goal of sustainable development is the long-term stability for the economy and the environment. Basically, as I said before, it's about intergenerational intergener equity. So we need to conserve the capital, uh, social, natural, and man-made capital, let's call it, uh, resources for future generations. We need to basically let the earth uh, at the same in the same status as we find it for future generations. Um, of course, uh, uh, this is much easier to say than to do it. But as I said, I invite you to check on the web page of Global Geoparks and find all the status. Geopark and sustainability. Uh, Geopark contributes to long-term stability of the economy because we work with the local communities, local enterprise, nature, cultural-based development projects. Uh, we generate direct and indirect costs to the community in the respect of the nature and uh, in the respect of the people and indigenous culture where they are existing. Uh, most of all, we work uh, with the future generation for uh, try to, as I said, work on equity and long-term stability for the environment. Uh, and here it comes in GeoFood. The GeoFood, it's uh, an initiative led by Magma UNESCO Global Geopark in Norway, which is uh, has its roots in the values and in the objectives and in uh, the philosophy and in the um, definition of UNESCO Global Geopark. Uh, GeoFood, uh, it's basically a brand, but it's mu also much more than a brand. Geo GeoFood encompass geoparks, territories, the people that live in there, the nature, and the local food. GeoFood, why we decided to develop GeoFood? As I said, UNESCO Global Geopark are managed with holistic approach, holistic 
means the part of something that are interconnected in a very intimate way, and they are explicable only by reference to the world. Actually, it's a very good expression of holistic approach, GeoFood, because GeoFood is uh, uh, including um, local communities, the connection with the geological heritage, uh, and uh, education for people, education for schools, and we want to develop food narrative for explaining geopathological phenomena around the globe. Uh, what GeoFood is contributing to? Uh, first of all, I need to say that GeoFood is only for UNESCO Global Geopark Territories. Um, Geopark Territories can ask Magma Geopark the use of the brand and the use of the manifesto and the values relating to it. Manifesto of GeoFood it uh, um, has its roots into the uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goal and into the uh, FAO uh, main strategy and European strategy from farm to fork. Through the use of manifesto and criteria, the territories can start to implement and uh, within their local communities, local products and storytelling that explain geology and culture. We basically, support the local sustainable enterprise. We only work with a small medium enterprise, which has normally a very um, low scale of production. We empower communities because we do education, linking the geopark activities and uh, the uh, importance of the use of local source raw material for food product, uh, involving restaurant in serving local food uh, uh, kilometer zero raw material, we also reduce the CO2 impact um, and we sensibilize the population in the importance of using local resources. Uh, at the moment, we have 34 members in 21 countries. Uh, these 34 members are all UNESCO Global Geopark and we are all working, not only uh, as UNESCO Global Geopark, sharing the same values and the same project and same networking activities, but we're also working together for local development in food product. Uh, as you can see, uh, in uh, three, four years, the, the, the initiative has grown uh, enormously. And uh, as I said, GeoFood is contributing to several United Nations Sustainable Development Goal. Uh, I'm not going to read all of it, but just to give you an idea, we contribute to the goal number two, of course, to, to the goal number three, the sustainable food strategy development. We uh, contribute to the, to the goal number eight, because we also support job creation, creativity, entrepreneurship. Uh, we uh, offer proper job condition. In fact, one of the uh, mission of GeoFood and one of the criteria is that the enterprise which enter inside GeoFood has to be uh, registered and has to pay taxes, of course, and has to have a, a specific uh, uh, rule for employees and everything should be uh, linked with social equality, as we said. Uh, we, empower, we empower women, like all UNESCO Global Geopark do. Uh, with GeoFood, we support uh, within UNESCO Global Geopark the born of new cooperative of women in undeveloped country uh, through the local food valorization uh, and promotion. We, of course, work on sustainable tourism uh, and, and much more than that. So as I said, uh, we are developing narrative, narrative storytelling that link geology, geomorphology, uh, geodiversity, landscape development and culture and food. Uh, so basically we collecting also uh, together with um, explanation re regarding the soil, the mineral components, the ecosystem or the landscape uh, um, evolution across the century in the geopark, we combine this kind of information with knowledge provided by the local communities, heritage know-how, and knowledge on, pro on production. So we are combining geological scientific contents with cultural um, uh, intangible uh, traditions that could not be lost with the geopark bottom-up approach. These are some examples for you to be seen. Uh, we have Oleo Ext from Villuercas UNESCO Global Geopark in Spain. They develop a specific storytelling relating with uh, the production and the connection with the production of the oli olive and the soil. On the other side, you have the water from Lankawi. Lankawi UNESCO Global Geopark in Malaysia is starting to bottle uh, local source water 
uh, that it didn't happen before geofood. So this is a big step for the environment. Uh, of course, we develop uh, information material, which is available on our webpage, and you can find it, uh, geofood.no. Information material, which has been translated in several languages, almost all the languages of the, of the, of the network. Uh, we have, at the moment, uh, 45 restaurants and uh, uh, 73 producers and two food trails. Of course, restaurant and producer that are working across your food are many more, but we register on the page only the final product, the one that has storytelling, they have the brand on their page, the, the connections with the geology, and everything is into place. Uh, I took some example from Magma UNESCO Global Geopark. We work with this uh, lamb. This kind of lamb is a traditional Viking lamb. Uh, is a piece of lamb that they are not really so diffused in Norway. So we kind of uh, uh, work with a small uh, uh, enterprise to promote uh, uh, their development. And of course, we work with the honey producer. We open a small shop about local food. The local mat means local food. This has been a big achievement in our geopark before, because before um, a huge project that is called Ruritech and the geofood networking, we didn't have a local um, a local shop that sell local product. So to us was a huge, excuse me, was a huge achievement. And uh, now the shop has been taken over by the a restaurant. So you can sell, you can buy local product and at the same time having and enjoy a local meal. Uh, we have developed a, a, a food trail. Our food trail is connecting several producers and several farmers and we explain uh, with um, with a, a small storytelling, their um, their peculiarities. Why uh, this Western Red Pole cattle is uh, is now bred in Magma Geopark? Why they are bred in this place? Why the their legs are so short? Why the connection with an orthosite, which is the rock, the main rock of Magma Geopark? What has to do with the connection with the leg of the of the cattle? Actually, we explain all these stories and uh, and empower the local communities. We have also example from Korea. They have been uh, collecting uh, raw material from the geopark, is it Mudeon Sang, uh, and they are creating a, a local um, recipe for their uh, local restaurant, explaining the connection with the clean, clean food of mountain Mudeon Sang, which is also the name of the geopark, and uh, explaining also the importance of eating locally and uh, and buy local food, which is now on sale in several shops. Uh, at Hatteg in Romania, uh, they opened the first geofood restaurant. The geofood restaurant is serving one, at least one seasonal menu, which is changing depending by the season, which is made by local producer. Then we go to Ireland in the Cliff of Moher UNESCO Global Geopark. Cliff of Moher has already, before becoming geofood partner, they've already had a very strong network of uh, local producers, which already explained the connection with the geological heritage of the Barren. But uh, they uh, really like to join the international part of, of uh, GeoFood because uh, local, the local brand didn't give them the international visibility. So actually they made huge, uh, huge achievement and a, a lot of events where I also been involved to, to um, uh, connect the local community to the GeoFood brand. And now they have a network of about 12 producers that uh, produce even oyster. The story about the oyster is rather nice because the, the place that produced it, they decide to start to uh, fish oyster locally uh, in order to become GeoFood. So they change their food chain in order to the food chain uh, uh, the, uh, provide the way of providing food for their shop in order to become geofood. So that's for me was a big achievement because our idea with geofood was is really to give an impact on climate change and CO2 and change the behavior of people that are living in the geopark. Um, in Tosca Mining Geopark, which is in Tuscany in Italy, uh, we give a big impact. Uh, Tuscany has about five million people as a, as a region. Just to give an idea, they get about uh, 10 million tourists per year. And uh, we, they open 12 geofood point that sell it inside uh, already organized shop. So geofood in Tuscany has an impact on uh, about uh, 10, let's say, let's say that not all the tourists goes into the, into the shop. 
And let's say that not all the inhabitants going to the shop, but if you make an average, it's about 6 million people that get influenced by our, uh, our little brand and our philosophy and the geopar philosophy. Because the idea, they develop, of course, also wine. The, the whole idea is that reading the bottle, people get aware that they are inside the UNESCO Global Geopark. And then they get curious. And through the QR code, they go and they read the story about that. And then they get even more engaged on the geology and the culture. And then you, you link the visitors and the people that live in the area to the Geopark even more. And they develop, of course, um, pasta, biscuit. The peculiarity of uh, Tuscany is that they certify geofood, the flower, from the farm to the fork, to the from the flour to the biscuit to the pasta. So the whole food chain, filiera, is certified geofood. Of course, we also have a partner in, uh, in the Novograd Mohorad Geopark and the border with uh, Hungary and Slovakia is a cross-border UNESCO Global Geopark. They are doing a great job as well with local communities, uh, developing uh, a new partnership and new uh, restaurant in the frame geofood. Uh, in Idria, in Slovenia, uh, they work very well uh, with the tourist board of, uh, of Idria and they are developing uh, products uh, that are connecting cultural heritage with, uh, with food and with geology, like the lace and honey. Lace is one of the traditional craft in Idria, in Slovenia, made by women when men were in the, in the mining. And uh, the, almost all the miners has, uh, has, um, were also beekeeper. So combining the laces, the honey, they also remind to the history of the mine, to the history, to their own place, and of course, to the geology. Um, then we go to Canada and Discovery. They developed this Bunabuk Kombucha. It's a small enterprise. Uh, they, they, um, they pick the berries within Discovery UNESCO Global Geopark, and they uh, discovered the old recipe from the indigenous people living in the geopark. And they are now selling it and advertising both the geopark and both the sustainability of it. Uh, in Las Loras in Spain, they have a project that involve uh, the farmers. And, and most of all, they have a project relating with potatoes, which is not here in, in shown, but it is really uh, extremely well developed. Uh, they they collect different variety of potato and they inform the people the, about the connection with the soil and the quality of potato and different potato, empowering local citizens and visitors. Uh, we go also to Finland very briefly, but I think it's nice to show you the difference of our of our product. And uh, they are serving um, a burger with the. Uh, made by uh, this kind of uh, elk <laughs> living in Finland. They serve in burger in this nice restaurant. The elk is living in the geopark. And then they describe in the menu the connection with the geology and the culture. That's uh, the power of geofood. Estrella is also in Portugal. They are doing a great job as well. Like everyone is working with us all together. We are, we are doing the best that we can. We have, of course, also in Estrella, we have biscuit and we have also uh, honey and, uh, and amazing wine. Uh, Geofood is not only promotion of local uh, uh, enterprises or valorization of uh, local product and restaurant, but it's also about education and research, as I said. Um, Geofood Edu, as uh, we, we hashtag in the social media, is now starting in Portugal. All the five UNESCO Global Geopark in Portugal are uh, embracing Geofood uh, brand almost since the beginning, means around 2015, 2016. They are working extremely, extremely well together, and, and they are also developing a common educational uh, program. In the context of the World Food Day has been launched, and uh, they basically teach uh, in all the geopark environmental friendly agriculture and the importance of healthy food to new generations uh, and the connection with the geology and the geodiversity of their fantastic five territories. And they also work very well with the uh, uh, trainee uh, because also uh, the tourism board of Portugal has uh, decided to use GeoFood as one of the official brand for the tourism in Portugal. Uh, and all the five territories there, they are working in developing a um, food trail, uh, connecting GeoFood producer in the five territories. And uh, um, 
this uh, Melaine Sampaio and Joanna Rodriguez. They are working. Joanna Rodriguez is the manager of uh, GeoFood in uh, Natutej UNESCO Global Geopark in Portugal. They're working together with the trainee to start to uh, analyzing uh, uh, how to create this uh, food trail. In Magma Geopark and Katla UNESCO Global Geopark in, uh, in Iceland, we just finished a project which is also including territories that are not geofood, but it's a project about local food. And of course, geofood has been stressed in Magma and in Katla because we can use it because we are UNESCO Global Geopark. We collect stories about, you, uh, about local uh, communities, uh, traditions, legend, but also the use of, uh, of sustainable food resources like seaweed or uh, like uh, our third generation of beekeeper in Magma Geopark, uh, which is almost 100 years old. He gave us an interview, he gave us our e story, and we also supporting the, the, um, the protection of the brown bee, which are living mostly only in the Nordic country. This book is available on issue under Magma Geopark, if you like to see it as a wonderful drawing. Uh, we also developed GeoFood video, the GeoFood educational video, that's been uh, has been run in Magma and again in Katla, UNESCO Global Geopark, and also in Faroe Island. Without being geofood, they also still register local food uh, tradition from local people. They're also available on YouTube if you like to take a look. Uh, we've been awarded in uh, 2021 uh, as a special award uh, for geofood for sustainable development. We've been awarded by the International Geoscience and Geopark Program. Um, uh, actually, uh, we are now 57 individual partners from 26 countries. This is a research project where also aspiring Geopark and universities and Geopark project are involved. So it doesn't need to be only UNESCO Global Geopark already recognized. We are collecting good practices, ideas, and we are working on several uh, on several issues. We are working on gathering data. That was the first, uh, the first result of the, fir the, of, the, of the first year. And we are now developing methodologies for the geofood assessment. Uh, basically, we are developing a checklist for making a, a new uh, geopark or a ready established geopark to better implement geofood in the territories. In the frame of this project, we have developed uh, a table game, which is uh, for free to be downloaded from the web page. It's a table game. It's a very simple table game, which aims on uh, making people, kids, understanding uh, um, the importance of uh, local resources and ecosystem within a UNESCO Global Geopark. Which kind of element do you need to create a geo product or a geo food product? Uh, please download it and play it and let us know uh, if you like it and what we could, uh, what we could improve. Uh, here we were at the first, uh, in, let's say, face-to-face -face meeting that we managed to, had, to have at the European Geopark Conference in Cesia Valgrande Geopark uh, last September. Uh, thanks to the support of the project, uh, the International Geoscience Program project, we've been uh, able to support uh, um, three young scientists, women from uh, third countries to come, uh, Soma from Iran, and uh, the other two friends from Kutralkura and from Gruta del Palacio in Uruguay. They join our meeting and we exchange good practices, we exchange friendship and we discuss uh, how to proceed further for this project. We had the online meeting and here is it's the last initiatives that we've been involved in, uh, thanks to um, Dr. Jack Matthews, which is the, the um, the doctor in charge for the Geodiversity Day he was the one of the main promoters. Uh, there is now running at UNESCO in Paris a geodiversity exhibition uh, where all the geopark contribute uh, uh, to show the difference in the geodiversity of each territory. And together with the geodiversity, also geofood is uh, it's, uh, on display uh, to underline the importance of the connection with different uh, uh, geological heritage and the connection with the food and the explanation of what we are doing here. There are some pictures for that. Um, again, we are on all social media, so please follow us. We are in uh, Facebook, we are in LinkedIn, Twitter, um, and we are very pleased to reply to all your questions. And please visit our webpage and uh, 
remember that uh, taking actions for climate change is not about saving other species, it's about saving ourselves. Please don't hesitate to contact me if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah, for this interesting uh, presentation. Uh, it is uh, really important uh, for uh, one uh, aspect to um, continue to focus our attention uh, on what we can do to make a better planet. Uh, and one of the things is to um, uh, try to engage local people to uh, uh, sell and to produce local products. And I think GeoFood is one of the best ways and a, a great way to, to achieve that. So congratulations on this project. And I hope that other geoparks could uh, also join the brand. And of course, not in geoparks, but in our communities, we can also uh, do that by um, producing and by uh, buying uh, local products and so reducing our uh, CO2 um, footprint. Uh, so uh, uh, we have some time for um, for questions and we have al already three. Uh, so uh, the first question uh, from Ufuk Elmas. Uh, do you think replacement of energy sources without unnecessary consumption habits would uh, save the planet or would um, make us uh, on the dry direction of uh, have a better planet? Concerning energy, I have to say I'm not an expert in this thematic, but I have my opinion and of course it's an opinion of someone that just read but i'm not i'm not working on this field energy is a really huge thematic and a really complex thematic but what can i say my own idea is that uh, especially now in europe we're having this huge problem uh, but they have even bigger problem in ukraine i think they they have a bigger problem than us uh, anyway concerning the the lack of of uh, of, um, of methane gas or gas that is coming uh, we are all discussing energy a lot here in Italy and also in Norway, actually. So it's a very, it's a very good question. It's a very, uh, let's say, uh, actual question. I think uh, uh, going to renewable resources, it's one of the solutions, but it cannot be done only uh, that action. I don't think that only that action uh, could really uh, save us and make us not overpassing the limit of 1.5 degrees that we've been discussing and it should be the limit that we do not outpassing. I think, of course, uh, it's one of the actions that should be done, but it could, it must be uh, surrounded by uh, a, a totally different approach <laughs> uh, in human development. I think we need a change in our way of thinking. Uh, consumism, it cannot work anymore. We cannot just buy and throw away. Uh, our planet is full of our trash. We do not need everything that we buy. And as I said, a, a, a small percent of the planet has the biggest uh, part of the money. And a very a very high percent of the planet, it's the one that uh, have the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, uh, problem with climate change and are the one that have less impact on the climate. So there's also a huge disparity in that because we need to change paradigm of development. So it's a little bit a complex, uh, complex development, complex thematic, yes. Okay, thank you. So the second question also from uh, Ufuk Elmas. Uh, the product of food, is uh, talking about uh, the GeoFood brand and he asked if the product uh, needs to be from the Geopark area. Yeah, the, to become geofood, uh, the all the one of the main criteria is that the raw material uh, must come from the geopark area. I mean, if I do biscuit, uh, the grain, the flour, and uh, not the sugar and not the salt, we made a we made a small comma about that. Uh, but all the rest of the ingredients should come from the from the geopark zone. Yes. Okay. And uh, his last question uh, for now, uh, he asked how, how can uh, someone apply to GeoFood certification? Yeah, if you are, if you are a, a UNESCO Global Geopark Manager, 
uh, you can just contact uh, me, Sara Magmagio for .no, and we can discuss about that. If you are a producer inside a UNESCO Global Geopark, I kindly invite you to contact the, the manager of, uh, or of your own UNESCO Global Geopark and get in contact with us. Okay, so we have a, a question from RD Nicodia, and uh, I think you have already maybe uh, answered it, but he asked if uh, a product, uh, well, if a country doesn't have a geopark, he cannot um, apply for a geofood brand, of course. No, he cannot, but he can be part of our EGCP project in case there is a aspiring uh, geopark in place or a geopark project uh, to develop that that's open for uh, for uh, also for territories that are not unesco global geopark yet okay so and uh, one question for for carl dean uh, he say, he says he's from bohel island aspiring to unesco global geopark in the philippines um, are products under the geofood brand generally more expensive Mm, uh, actually, I think local small scale products are generally more expensive <laughs> by themselves, but GeoFood, it doesn't really increase the price. But, you know, if you buy a very specific uh, quality of rice that grows only in that part of Italy, uh, it's, of course, more expensive than uh, uh, general rice that you can buy everywhere. That is valid for all food products, I suppose. Um, is there anyone who would like to ask uh, another question? Ah, uh, Maria João, um, she says it's a really great presentation, congratulations. Uh, regarding the soil's use and real protection of this essential resource, what are the practices that are mostly followed and teached in the geoparks that are in the geofood? Concerning the protection of soil, Yes, the soil divide. Yeah, well, actually, we are um, we are uh, uh, try to to teach that uh, to produce a certain amount of soil. It took a long, long time <laughs> to say it very, very simple. So we are try to reduce the use of soil for constructions or for well, but most of the country that you are working on already have the national regulation about that. So we do not really work on regulation. What do we teach to the kids is that we teach the fact that the food is coming from the ground. Uh, it seems rather obvious, but actually they made a survey in the uh, US and they find out that 30% uh, of the kids more or less think that the, the, the milk it comes from the cartoon, not from the cow. Uh, and that's a little bit a problem. But in most of the geopark are rural areas. So the connection between uh, rurality and school, uh, at least in Magma UNESCO Global Geopark, is very much linked. So kids are very aware also because probably their family had a farm or they still have a farm. But of course, the area are not all the same. There are very urbanized areas also pressing the geopark around the globe. And in that sense, it's very important to simply underline the connection with nature and food that what we eat is coming from earth and, and the soil should not be polluted because or as we eat the pollution. That's very simple. Okay, thank you. Another question from Ratko Vasilijevic. I'm sorry because <laughs> there are names that <laughs> I cannot pronounce uh, in just one second. <laughs> um, one small comment, maybe it is off topic, but there is several interesting examples of application of geothermal water in Croatia for eating of greenhouses and use of release CO2 for increasing crops. So this is a, a, a way for uh, capturing CO2 and reducing it. It is very interesting. Way. Actually, also one of our partners uh, is Katla, uh, UNESCO Global Geopark, and the other geopark in Iceland, they use geothermal for their farms, and that's, that's very actual and it's very interesting. Yes, and geothermal is being uh, now uh, Stud studied and uh, uh, there are a lot of projects, European projects about the geothermal energy that we can uh, uh, start to use or continue to use in order to uh, have 
some uh, uh, different kinds of energy sources. Uh, so yes, this is a, a very good comment. Anyone have another question for Sarah? I think there was a question in the chat and I have kind of reply. They asked me a good presentation about the question participant and what step can aspiring geopark make towards getting the geo food? First of all, you have to become UNESCO Global Geopark, <laughs> but of course you can be part of the EGCP project. Just contact me and we will talk about it, of course. Uh, so uh, maybe if there is uh, no uh, more questions, uh, I think we can uh, another one. Alicia from Discovery UGGP, is there a way that we can better support encourage geoparks that are participating in the program? We can better support encourage geoparks as geoparks, I mean. Uh, we can better support we as uh, as member of geofood uh, or we as uh, mm, i don't understand the question oh, we can better support and call geoparks that are participating in the pro uh, uh, well as magma unesco global geopark we we are um, we are uh, thinking now to establish uh, its own company that runs geofood so then we can have private and public investors, we can have employee, we can develop it uh, in a more professional way to get to give more support and to offer more services and to expand ourselves. But it is a little bit a big process to create a spin-off, but we are working on the business model. So just to tell you that I'm not really, uh, I, I, I really like to go further with this, uh, with this idea. And uh, of course, in connection with UNESCO Global Geopark. Um, Ah, okay, how can Discover better engage? How can Discover better engage the local people? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, uh, there are uh, several good practices that we are collecting in the EGCP project. In the checklist we are making, there will be also some, some example how Geopark in different parts of the world are engaging local communities to start to talk about geofood and uh, what are the success story and what are the not success story. I can tell you in Norway, Magmunesco Global Geopark, it took uh, about uh, seven years to have a network of uh, 15 producers because the farmers are living far away to get far, far away from each other. They are not used to work together uh, and uh, uh, it takes time, but in the end, uh, some outcome will come depending by there. And I suppose the discovery uh, in Canada is more or less uh, as as Norway, uh, farmers are very far from each other and maybe not too used to work together. But uh, uh, don't give up. Uh, organize webinar and organize a meeting and you must visit the farmers. You must go there and visit them and talk to them. Uh, farmers are uh, very occupied because they work um, all, all day long, especially in the summer. So I suggest you to do that in the winter time when they have a little bit more time and bring with you a local person because we find out it is very important to be local because people know each other in the community and speak their own languages. Uh, in Magma, we have a lot of dialects. So it's important to go with a person with the right dialect, for instance. So um, thank you, Sarah, and thank you for all uh, participants that uh, were here with us today. We have uh, another question from uh, Ufuk Elmas. How geologists would be part of this business without being a producer? Kind of consultant? Yeah, so why can geologists involved in geofood? The, the, the geologists are already involved because uh, uh, to develop the geological story and to work in the geopark, you must have a geologist. And to have geofood, you need to be in the geopark. So then you need a geologist. So actually geologist is a big part of it. What we need is geologists that are able to develop storytelling in a simple way, not geologists that write as alpha book to describe, but <laughs> and that's more difficult to find. <laughs> uh, normally, we, we, I'm joking, but uh, you know better than me, to explain geological phenomena is not easy in a few words in a catchy way. So actually uh, we need to combine good geologists with good storytellers. 
and good marketing also because uh, to sell in product and to make people buying you also need marketing and marketing is all not all, all only negative marketing can be also uh, a way to teach to people so that's uh, that's the answer uh so uh i i think the presentation would be sent to all the participants yes sir yeah of course i think yeah. so you like of course okay it so be uh the recording yes. will also be um, available right yeah nice. i think so yeah yeah okay nice so uh again if there is uh no other questions um i would like again to thank you sarah for this uh, great presentation for um uh not awakening because we we know uh, the problems of our planet of course so may, many of us uh here uh, are geologists and of course we um we worry uh about uh what kind of planet we want to leave to other generations and of course we are uh, also um very uh interested in uh, continue to uh, of course offer uh, raw materials and critical materials to to the society but in a sustainable way so uh, i think geoparks are uh, a territory when where uh we can explain to the society and to the communities the the importance of uh, geology the importance of geology to society uh, not only to explain the beautiful landscapes and uh, uh the beautiful volcanoes or uh but also what we can as a, a profession offer to society and also this is um this uh, imposes um a great responsibility to explore exploit uh our uh, natural resources with care and with responsibility and uh with sustainability so we have to work together in order to have a better planet and also educate for less consumption consumption uh, because as you said uh we don't need everything that we buy so uh and we also have to educate great uh enterprises and companies not to selling products that in two years or uh, are outdated and people need to buy uh, uh, again so um thank you um everyone for uh being with us here today uh, it was a great pleasure to have Sara to to host this uh, webinar thank you very much for the european federation of geologists for inviting me uh, and inviting Sarah, of course and we see you uh, in the next webinar or in the next EFG event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Bye.